Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's concert, which is part of the 19th annual uh, John Sullivan Memorial Lecture. My name is Dr. Candace Cunningham. I am a history professor here at FAU. Um, tonight's concert, Summer of Soul, a retrospective, is a collaborative effort between the History Symposia series directed by Professor Steve Engel and the commercial music program under the direction of Professor Michael Zager. Tonight's musical selection is based on the Oscar-winning film, Soul of Summer, which documented the Harlem Cultural Festival. The same summer of Woodstock, 1969, the Harlem Cultural Festival was a six-week event featuring some of the nation's best black musicians. Tonight, you will hear music performed live under the direction of FAU alum, Sam Miller, and some of FAU's most talented musicians, students, and faculty. I suspect many of you have heard a YouTube video that circulated social media of our first song. It is Marvin Gaye's isolated vocals, um, and I heard it through the grapevine. As one writer said, the remaining vocals are the pure, undulterated talent of one of the greatest artists of the 21st century, of the 20th century. As Ebony Magazine reported, 10 years after his tragic demise, Marvin Gaye wrote and sang about sexuality, spirituality, love lost and found. His voice moved an entire generation when he sang about the era's most pressing issues, poverty, prejudice, pollution, war. Gaye found a way to speak to our minds as well as our hearts. Please enjoy this evening's first song, I Heard It Through the Grapevine.
Smokey Robinson said that the temptations inspired him to write our next song. And when people would ask him why he didn't keep the hit song to himself, he would say, I probably would have never ever written My Girl. They inspire that. I thought it was a great subject for him, David Ruffin, to sing. So David, with his gruff voice like that, if I can get him to sing something sweet, I think it's going to be a hit. Please enjoy My Girl. Although B.B. King is most closely associated with the 1950s and 60s, he released his last album in 2008, just seven years before his death. As one commenter noted, his last album wasn't just good, it was brilliant, winning a Grammy for Best Traditional Blues Album. In his autobiography, Eric Clapton declared B.B. King the most important artist the blues has ever produced. King's 1955 recording of our next song, Every Day I Have the Blues, made it to number eight on the Billboard R&B charts and became a staple of blues concerts. In 2004, it was inducted into the Grammy Awards Hall of Fame. Notably, the song was also recorded in 1955 by the Count Bassey Orchestra. That version had already joined the Grammy Awards Hall of Fame in 1992. Please enjoy Every Day I Have the Blues.
King performed our next song in 1981 as part of a 40-minute set in front of 3,000 inmates at Michigan's largest walled prison. In fact, that was his 38th prison concert. He performed the song 10 years earlier at a performance at Chicago's Cook County Jail, and he released a live album of that concert that made Rolling Stone's 500 Best Albums list. As his keyboardist Ron Levy remarked, if anybody had the blues, it was those people incarcerated. And B.B. really felt compassion for those guys. People don't realize B.B. King was much more than just a musician and entertainer. He's a human being, a humanitarian. He cared. He's one of the really good guys. There aren't many like him in history. He's not just the king of blues. He's one of the kings of humanity. Please enjoy The Thrill is Gone.
Hancock wrote our next song as a reflection of his experience growing up as a black youth in Chicago. He was trying to capture the rhythm of a horse and buggy on cobblestone back alleys. Hancock said he overheard Mango Santa Maria say he hadn't identified the link between Afro-Cuban music and Afro-American music. But when Hancock started playing Watermelon Man, Mongo and the other musicians joined in and created the song we all know and love. By the time Hancock released his 1973 album, Headhunters, that link Mongo Santa Maria had been searching for had been discovered. As Ebony Magazine reported in 1973, if it has been said, it has been said that Afro-Cuban music is the link between black American jazz and African music. One could not dispute this concept upon listening to Mongo Santa Maria. Please enjoy The Watermelon Man. Our next song was written by the songwriting duo of Isaac Hayes and David Porter and recorded by rock and roll greats Sam and Dave. But when these four men initially joined forces, they were all but the proverbial starving artists. As David Porter recalled, it was rough in those days and we had one beat up car between us. We wrote a song that didn't do too much 
But in 1964, Atlantic Records decided to send Sam and Dave here, here being Stax Records in Memphis, Tennessee, to record. They were looking as bad as we were, with shoes down one side. We were given six months to write a hit for them, and we came up with, you don't know, like I know. That first hit gave them permission to write and record another one, which is our next song, Hold On, I'm Coming. When Stevie Wonder recorded our next song in 1965, the 15-year-old Motown artist was still being referred to as Detroit's junior size Ray Charles. Our next song was the first hit single he co-wrote, and it climbed to number three on the Billboard Pop Singles Chart, and number one on the Billboard R&B Singles Chart. Junior size Ray Charles, who was no more. The song about a poor boy from the wrong side of the tracks, who was in love with a rich girl, was his first hit in the UK also. Please enjoy Stevie Wonder's Uptight.
Wonder released our next song in 1970, he was remaking himself as an artist. The song, which he co-wrote with singer-songwriter Soretta Wright, clearly marked his transition from child prodigy little Stevie Wonder, who fascinated audiences with his skills on the harmonica, to full-fledged adult artists. When Sign Silk delivered I'm Yours, spent six weeks on the R&B charts and two weeks on the number three on the Hot 100 uh, list, Wonder clearly had found his way. It was his sixth number one single and the first single on which he was listed as producer. Please enjoy Sign Silk Delivered. <laughs> Professor 
Alejandro Sanchez Samper, and I'm Sam Miller. Our next song was written by Sly Stone and recorded by his band, Sly and the Family Stone. It was the band's first number one single on the Billboard Hot 100 charts and stayed there four weeks. The songs with lyrics such as, there is a yellow one that won't accept the black one, that won't accept the red one, that won't accept the white one, was a clear plea for peace between different social groups a plea that was embodied by the band's own diversity as a mixed race, mixed gender group. As one commentator has said, Sly and the Family Stone's Everyday People is such a great song, and it seems to apply as much now as it did in 1968 when it was released as a single. These musicians created vital, incredible music. Please enjoy Everyday People. I'm right, then I can be wrong. My own beliefs are in my soul. A butcher, a baker, a drummer, and then makes no difference what group I'm in. Make sure everybody gives a round of applause to the back over there making it sound so wonderful tonight to Professor Matthew Bautrucki and Zachary Bender. Thank you so much. Just this year, American singer-songwriter Her dropped a cover of this Sly and Family Stone hit single, demonstrating the song's ongoing legacy. 
Rolling Stone referred to the song as the Sly Stone song most likely to be heard on a 1980s as advertised on TV compilation. <laughs> Within the group, the song had mixed reviews. Saxophonist Jerry Martin said, it was so unhip to us. The beats were glorified Motown. We did the formula thing. But according to one journalist, Sly himself said the single was the best bass and drum sounds I've ever got. Either way, when Sly and Family Stone released the song in 1968, it signaled their move to mainstream music and helped pave the way for the emergence of a new sound that would be called funk. Please enjoy Dance to the Music.
God. Wow. I wasn't planning on speaking tonight, but I want you to know that all you people who got in here for free, you now owe us all $100 each. And if you paid $20, it's 250 because these guys were awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Angle. Thank you. Let me say one final thing. I want, to, I want to thank Dr. Cunningham for narrating this evening. <laughs> Terrific job. I have to say, this performance makes Michael Zager and I look like a couple of geniuses. <laughs> Who would have thought there would be an encore at FAU after any concert? I mean, really, this type of encore, Stevie Wonder superstition. I want to thank you all for coming on behalf of the John O'Sullivan Memorial Lecture Concert. I want to thank you all for uh, being a part of a great collaboration with the Commercial Music Program and the History Department once again. And I have to say one thing. Last night on the University Lawn, we showed the movie Summer of Soul. It was a great time, and I will tell you that that movie was an, was an impactful movie as this concert was tonight. So if you haven't seen it, by all means, see the movie. Um, and please go away from this evening sharing a little joy, a little peace, and a, little, and a little part of FAU with this band. Thank you once again, people.